On September 11, 2001, these streets of New York changed forever. We all remember where we were that September morning. We remember how we heard the news, what we felt, what we saw. Tonight, you're going to meet three young filmmakers who also witnessed what happened that awful day. Only they saw it from the inside, and it's a view the rest of us haven't seen until now. I'm Robert De Niro. Last year, two French brothers, Jules and Gideon Norday, set out to make a film about a rookie New York fireman. They had no idea they would become eyewitnesses to the defining event of our time, but that they would capture the courage of those who faced hell on earth and the miracle of a lucky few who survived. The story begins last summer. With the help of a friend and firefighter, James Hanlon, the Norde brothers were allowed to follow the men of Engine 7 Ladder 1. It's one of the oldest firehouses in New York, just a few blocks from here. For months, the material they shot was routine, uneventful. September 11th was no different until 8.46 that morning. Engine 7 Ladder 1 was one of the first to arrive at the World Trade Center. Jules Nodé was with them, and his camera never stopped rolling. It's the only footage from inside Tower 1. What you're going to see has been edited with great care. Still, some of the language is rough. After all, these men had never been tested like this before. This is the story of how the city's bravest rose to their greatest challenge on September 11th. When you work in a firehouse seven blocks from the two tallest buildings in New York, you get to know every step, every staircase, every story. Good morning, Jim. Couldn't get too close to that razor blade. I'm James Hamlin. I've been a New York City firefighter for nine years at Ladder One downtown. Last summer, the summer before 9-11, there were days we'd go to the Trade Center five times in a single shift. My point is, we knew those towers as well as anybody. But nobody, <laughs> nobody expected September 11th. On that day, guys from my firehouse, my best friends, were some of the first firefighters in the Tower One after the plane hit. What they did that day, what everyone there did, was remarkable. Chief! And almost as remarkable, it was captured on videotape inside the tower, beginning to end. And tonight, you'll see all of it. The tape was shot by two brothers. Jules and Gideon Noday. Holy shit. They're documentary filmmakers and old friends of mine. <laughs> I don't know. They always say there is always a witness for history, I guess. We were, that day, we were chosen to be the witness. The strange thing is, the tape, the whole story, 
It kind of happened by accident. I mean, Jules and Gideon didn't mean to make a documentary about 9-11. We wanted to make a documentary about a, a firefighter. That's how the whole thing got started. Nine, ten, one, two, three. More to the point, the plan was to follow a rookie. On the job, we call them probies. The idea was to show how a kid, almost, uh, become a man in nine months. Which is their probationary period, where they have to prove themselves. Let's go, guys. We up in the apartment. We teamed up, and by last June, the three of us were out at the fire academy shooting the training. Help. Help. And trying to decide which one of the 99 new probies test, test. would be the perfect probie. My name is Paul Denver. John Carroll. Antonios Benetatos. T Tony for short. I was a police officer. For a while, I was a, a pizza man, actually, an Irish pizza man in the Bronx. This is my first job. It sounds kind of cheesy, but I always kind of wanted to be a hero, and this is really the only thing you could do that you can do that. Immediately, we're like, okay, this is the kid. This is the kid. Let's, let's go. We got Tony assigned to my firehouse, one of the biggest in the city. It's Ladder One, plus a whole other company, Engine 7. I'm so glad I, I took this job. Can't beat it. What, what you don't it? actually it's wear it. That's what it says. They are the greatest, incredible guys. They're guys who fought some of the worst fires you can imagine. What's up with that shirt? What? What's the matter? Soon, they'd face the unthinkable. Question was, would Tony be ready? I'm terrified. This is what I want to do, but it's it's scary. I just hope I can I can do everything that I'm supposed to do. You know, I'm still worried about how I'm going to actually react when there's fire flying over my head. Here he goes. What's your first name? Tony. Tony. You know, you, you come in on uh, Thursday, right? Thursday? Yeah. I wasn't sure of that. Thursday night. I am now, sir. Do you want, need to sit down? <laughs> sir, thank you. Want to stop calling me, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little bit nervous. All right. I just I want to make sure I do everything I'm supposed to do. All right. Thing is, when you're a probie, what you're supposed to do... We got to do the sheets. We change the sheets in the mornings. ...is pretty much everything. More news and traffic coming up. It's 6.22. Oh, ah, I got work. <laughs> Start up top and we'll watch the breakdown. You have an iron at home? Uh, actually, I did not. Uh, Probably be in a lot of trouble. Uh, well, so Take two. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm doing decently. You know, I'm still waiting for a fire. That's all. I'm just waiting for a fire. And uh, I think that'll, that'll, you know, make a pretty big difference. Yeah. Engine. Should we grab that big long thing from the back too? <laughs> the thing is, guys say there's two kinds of probes. We're getting closer. Black clouds and white clouds. When a black cloud comes to the firehouse, that probie, he brings all the fires in the city with him. White cloud, just the opposite. No fires. Don't get me wrong, there were fires. Just not when Tony was on duty. The kid was one very white cloud. Tony was nervous, of course. Terribly nervous. And as the days would pass, uh, Tony, waiting for his first fire, wanted to prove to the other guys, and even more to himself, that he was going to be a real 
a great fireman. Uh, uh, Tony, yeah. I'll be right back. Yeah. So, guys, we're not going to make it easy on him. No one was singling Tony out. We do it to every probie. We're going to break your chops till you laugh about it. Right. Because that's how we go. All we'll right. tease you to death until you start laughing. Right. No okay. problem. You gotta love this one. No, I. So no, and you will. Yeah. But before you can love it, you've got to learn it. Now, say you got up there now, got your helmet on, your bunker gear, and you, you got to get your mask on. How are you going to do that without letting go? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Stop moving, guys. It's hot in here. Hurry up. Make a quick sweep. It's hot. The next time you do this, you're going to be more cautious. Right. You did, you did fine. Mm. All I want you to do is learn to relax. OK. Well. Not bad. No. Not bad. That handwriting's getting better already. <laughs> thank you. All right. <laughs> hey, day baby. Yes. OK, thank you. For two weeks, I got $672.25. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. You couldn't even buy a six pack with that. Holy crap. It's starting pay, you know? If I wanted to get rich, I would have become a lawyer. But I wanted something that I'd be able to live with for the rest of my life. This I can live with. A lot of the guys feel that way. You need to get up in the morning and look yourself in the, in the mirror and, and say you, you, you're doing something with your life. It's been uh, four weeks, I think, five weeks, something like that. And I'm still, still no fire, but it'll come. Probably when I'm asleep and not ready for it, that's when it'll come. It's too early in the morning, bro. <laughs> you can sleep. You can. All right. Trust me. When the alarm goes off, they'll come and get you. Okay. <laughs> Listen, Tony was getting closer. But for the record, that was some flame. It wasn't a real fire. starts to collapse, you gotta get off. You know, you gotta really improvise. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Basically, you have to be on the top of your game. Right. You're not the OV. You're on the top of your game. This right. is not a joke, this job. You know? Right. It's a lot of things to think about, you know? And tunnel vision, focus, right. really, because that's what's gonna keep you alive, and that's what's gonna give you the opportunity to help anybody else. Right. Yeah. Ready to go down? Fire or no fire, Tony had learned a lot that summer. Sure, he had a ways to go, but we'd teach him. Far as we knew, there was plenty of time. A few days later, Jules cooked a French dinner for the guys. At least he tried to decided to cook leg of lamb, which I told him for a long time was one of my specialties. I think he cooked one, 
and we really needed at least five. Where's Frenchy? A couple more meals like this, we'll be able to share shirts. All right, all right, I got a small piece, so what? Yeah, I made a mistake. <laughs> We stayed up late, just telling jokes and busting chops. That's it. That's all that's left. This is the best part of the meat. Even though the guys were making fun of us because we didn't cook uh, enough, we we're all having a great time. We we're getting uh, accepted. <laughs> We all joked all night long. It was really a great night. Little did we know. It was the night of September 10th. temperature about 80 degrees great weather for the primary election tonight clear and cool low 60 in the top. it's begun to sound like some sort of a cliche but really september 11th started out like every other day eight o'clock in the morning don't throw the fat away the day guys were just coming in i was off that day 13 guys from my firehouse were on Around 8.30. Engine, ladder. I believe the run came in. You get the run for the gas leak, or an odor of gas in the street, actually, I think it was. It was just Lispinard and Church, odor of gas. You know, I don't think anything of it. You just, you get on a rig, you go, you say, all right, it's an odor of gas. Jules was riding with the battalion chief, Joseph Pfeiffer, videotaping. It was just another call, and I'm riding with the battalion chief. It was basically camera practice. See, Jules had only been shooting for a few weeks. Before that, Gideon was the main cameraman. Every time the battalion goes, I go. You know, I just need to practice, so I shoot. Uh, no, I don't stop. We checked the area with meters, and it, it was kind of routine. It was 8.46 in the morning. That's when this stopped even resembling a normal day. Day of my life as a firefighter. Immediately, I knew this wasn't an accident. Oh my God! Oh my God. That looked like a direct attack. What? Chief Pfeiffer made the first official report. We have a number of floors on fire. It looked like the plane was aiming towards the building. Transmit a third along. We'll have the staging area. At and West Street. Yeah, it was probably a two-minute ride, but it seemed like it was forever because there was a lot of things going through your head. Everyone was passing, was looking up. It's like the world just stopped. We are just currently getting a look at the World Trade Center. We have something that has happened here. Flame and an awful lot of smoke from one of the towers. Whatever has occurred has just occurred uh, within uh, within minutes. And uh, we are trying to determine exactly what that is. Where you are, right in there? No, go right front. As we swung around in front of World Trade, my mind tells me, wow, this is, this is bad. What do we do? Like, what do we do for this? We park right under the awning of One World Trade Center. 
Chief Feinfried puts his gear on, and I remember asking him, you know, Chief, can I come in with you? I want, I want to come in with you. And he says, yeah. Yeah, you stay with me. Come in with me, never leave my side. We got the kill. I go in, and I hear screams. And right to my right, there was two people on fire, burning. I just didn't want to film that. It was like, no one, no one should see this. Pfeiffer was the first chief into the building. Right away, a guy from the Port Authority told him the damage was somewhere above the 78th floor. But all you had to do was look around. It was obvious something had happened right there in the lobby. You just, you just saw that all the windows were blown out. The lobby looked like the plane hit the lobby. Later, they'd figure out that flaming jet fuel had shot straight down the elevator shaft. All of this damage was done already. People was all over the place. So you knew it was going to be worse when we got upstairs. My main concern was we had you know, 20 floors of people above. And we had to figure out a way to get them out. As it turned out, we had no usable elevators. With the elevators out, there was only one way to get up there. Walk. Companies come in. You see them with a concerned look on their face. And they're sent up. A firefighter in full gear carrying 60-something pounds of hose and equipment. Takes about a minute to climb one flight of stairs. These guys were looking at 80 stories just to get there. Then they'd start working. I felt the mood that we were going to put the fire out. Everyone seemed to be confident. I know I was. You basically looked at it and said, OK, we got 10, 20 stories of fire. <laughs> you know, we'll deal with it. We'll get up there. You know, we'll, 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 we'll get to it. There are fire crews just screaming into this area from every conceivable direction. By this time, some of the top chiefs in the department had joined Chief Pfeiffer, running the command post, sending guys upstairs. Every time I looked around, it was new faces. Some that I, uh, I, I recognized. I had seen Chief Pronti, great guy, white hair, mustache, the perfect grandfather that you'd like to have. Remember seeing uh, Lieutenant Fody, who was uh, working with Nine Engine. Said hello, and then started going up. Another of the men who went up was Lieutenant Kevin Pfeiffer. He was in charge of Engine 33, and he was the chief's brother. I just remember we both looked at each other, said a few words, and but it was more the look with a, a real concern that this was uh, going to be something tough. It's going to be a tough job. It's going to be a long job. They'll put it out. That's what they do. The last time Jules had seen his brother was an hour ago at the firehouse. Far as Jules knew, Gideon had followed Tony, the probie, into the tower. When we had left for the order of gas in the street, for me, it was in the engine. And then when we arrived to the Trade Center, 
he went up immediately with the guys. So for me, my brother is going up the stairs. It turns out, Gideon was with Tony. Engine 7, ladder 1. This is Firefighter Benetata. But Tony was still at the firehouse. Yeah. No, I was off duty. And now he'd been ordered to stay there. Everybody's been recalled. All available units must come back to the firehouse. While Tony tried to keep up with the phones, this is Firefighter Benetata. Gideon took his camera and started walking down towards the Trade Center. He was sure his brother was inside, and he wanted to get to him. I remember uh, slowly walking down to the World Trade Center. What really stick in my mind is passing by the people and filming them and filming their astonishment. And the eyes saying, this is not happening. And you remember tilting the camera back and forth between the people and the tower in front of me. Towers of the World Trade Center have been hit by aircraft. Both are in flames. There is uh, black smoke coming from both of the towers. Uh, it's uh, a horrific scene here. There's um, debris flying through the air. Mayday. 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 There were two planes. I saw the second one hit. It hit the other tower. What we knew was that a second plane hit, and we had a lot of people trapped. Stay together. Stay together. We know what's going on. We're just going to have to walk in. One way to go. Second plane is motherfucking real. All right. Now the Chiefs would have to set up a whole other operation over in Tower 2. The second plane is. That's when you could see fear. Both of them are on fire. You could see it in everybody's eye. There were people from all over the world in these streets. Different colors, different languages. On those few blocks between the firehouse and the World Trade Center, the entire world was there. So two aircraft, two aircraft, the first one on one World Trade Center, the second one just happened. And they were all looking at the same thing and talking about the same thing and reacting the same way. Is there a plane? We saw it. A plane. Saw a plane we went straight into the building. Went straight into the building. Right there, into the Wait, side. Plane? Yes. A plane. Yes. That was a direct That's hit. That's a huge one. That was a huge one. Number two planes. Yeah. yeah. There's two. Yeah. One of these buildings. Yeah. 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 I saw the last one. We are boom in the house. What are those people going to do? On the second one? All, yeah. all the elevators are blocked out. Yeah. That, well, the staircases must still be. No. Right? The stairs were crowded. People were coming down burnt. Upstairs in Tower One, the guys from my firehouse were now 10 floors up and climbing. If we did talk, it was to the people coming down, trying to comfort them, tell them it's all right, get out, stay calm. 
I wound up finding a woman in the uh, sea staircase. Her arms were all burned. She was just sitting there, basically in shock. So I picked her up under her arms, and I put her in with a group of guys, and I asked the group of guys to, you know, take it down. I knew we had to get up to help people. We had to get up there. People pretty much said, why are y'all going up there? Get out. Bezig, zij pakt de fiets in plaats van de auto. En hij neemt ook een verstandige stap. Daar mogen we best even voor klappen. En kijk hem nou, gaat lekker skateboarden. Ja. Steeds meer mensen krijgen de smaak te pakken. Een half uurtje per dag, flink bewegen. Heel goed. Maar we gaan toch niet overdrijven, hè? Surf voor meer informatie naar flash123.nl. Nieuw bij SBSS. Uniek op de Nederlandse televisie. Medisch Centrum. Ervaar de dagelijkse realiteit van het personeel van het Erasmus MC in Rotterdam. Vanaf maandag 11 september. Iedere werkdag om vijf voor half zeven bij SBSS. Medisch Centrum. Their concern was to get everybody out. That was the key. As much people out as possible. Most of the people in Tower One came out on the mezzanine above the lobby. Then they'd get out through another building. All right, I want to use the lobby of seven as a tree act. The chiefs didn't want anyone going through the lobby doors. First, it was because debris was falling outside. Then, it was people falling. You don't see it, but you know where it is. What's that? And you know that every time you hear that crashing sound, it's, it's a life which is extinguished. It's not something you could get used to. And the sound was so loud. I just remember looking up, thinking, how bad is it up there that the better option is to jump? The FBI is now investigating reports of a plane hijacking before these crashes we're telling you about at the World Trade Center towers this morning. Pieces of the building and the planes actually landed blocks away. Gideon was walking with his camera when he found a chunk of the plane engine that had crashed completely through Tower 2. Don't be picking stuff. Don't get this as evidence. No, you don't pick it. All right, all right. All right just get out of here. Just go. This is evidence. You're kicking stuff. I'm out of it. That was as close as Gideon would get to the Trade Center, without a firefighter anyway. So I decided that the smartest thing to do was to slowly walk back to the firehouse and find a way to go to Jules. We're just getting word now. One of the two planes was hijacked after takeoff from Boston. This is Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. We now have reports of a fire at the Pentagon. Fire at the Pentagon being reported this morning. I was just saying that the officials are calling this a, an act of terrorism. They're saying that's clearly what it is, clearly not an accident. Arriving back at the firehouse, and Tony is still alone, and he has no clue of what to do. The Pentagon's on fucking fire? War. This is war. And just by listening to him, freaking out and swearing and, and behaving like I've never seen him behaving, Tony was expressing what we all felt. At that point, I saw the fireman in him taking over. I can't believe the fucking Pentagon. Somebody has balls. I mean, a few times he was just pulling his gear and about to rush to the door. 
realizing that he was the only one in charge of this empty firehouse. And going back to the house watch and looking again at those pictures on TV and just to make sure that it was real. Tony just wanted to go there. In the lobby, the chiefs were trying to run the largest rescue operation any of them had ever seen. With next to no information coming in from outside. You got a phone that's working? I think the entire world knew more than we did. Everybody had seen the attacks. Everybody had seen the tower burning. The New York avion s'est encastré dans une des deux. seen the Pentagon. For us, we didn't have a clue of what was going on outside our lobby. like a beehive, that place. Everybody's working on the phone, everybody's working on the radio. Everybody's getting information, sending guys up, getting reports. And just trying to get this thing under control. At one point, there was even a rumor. A third plane was heading in. You got to remember, at that moment, anything seemed possible. Other than NYPD, Port Authority, police, and the military. And I need that done now. On top of everything else, just talking to the guys in the stairwells was tough. Four David to Battalion 7. The tower's internal communication setup had been knocked out by the crash. That left fire department radio. Suddenly, you have hundreds and hundreds of firefighters that have radios. Seems to become more and more difficult. There's one guy in the WTC who was trying frantically to reach anyone on the elevators. 69 car, anyone in this car? Hello, is there anyone in this car? And going through the list. Hello, is there anyone in this car? And there's about 98 elevators in the World Trade Center. In the middle of all this, suddenly, an elevator opens up. And you see people not having a clue of what's going on. Because they've been stuck in there since the first plan hit. Are we seeing the look on the firefighters? It was not fear, it was what's going on. Disbelief. That made me panic a little bit. That made me panic. It was the first time I had seen Father Judge, the chaplain, 
as he's called. He was in the lobby with us, and he, I could tell that he was praying. You know, Father Judd, he, he would at least make eye contact with you and kind of give you a reassuring look. That wasn't occurring, almost like he knew that this was not good. at the firehouse. What's up? What's up? Off-duty guys were starting to show up. You know, Paul, we're just waiting right now. What's that? We're just waiting right now. Tony was, uh, he just had one thing in his mind. This is bad. To go there, and he couldn't. Two alarms right away. And, you know, and that's when Chief Burns arrived. I need a cup of coffee. Larry Burns joined the fire department in 1957, retired a battalion chief three years ago. I couldn't wait. I had to get down there. Because you know what? They're my firefighters. It's my building. It's my city. Can you do your gear all together? Get a flashlight and a bottle of water. OK. Tell the probe, get your gear, let's go. I remember Tony asking me to bring him some gloves, Kitty, medical grab gloves. Grab a box of gloves. Go grab a box of gloves. And by the time I found them and rushed back, they were gone. Proby and the retired chief were lost in the crowd, headed down to the Trade Center. I think at that point, the lobby was pretty empty. There were just a few of us in the lobby, and, and we were discussing tactics. This is Tower One. This is Tower One. Some of the outlying companies didn't know what Tower 1 was and Tower 2. So we were just trying to help them out by writing it on the desk to make it obvious to, to people. It was just before 10 o'clock, a little over an hour since the first plane hit. Firefighters from all over the city were inside those towers, hundreds of them. You remember I'm filming Chief Pfeiffer? And he's on the radio. situation that uh, started bad just gets worse and worse and worse. The World Trade Center, South Tower, which was hit by a plane and wracked by an explosion approximately an hour ago, has totally collapsed. What happened? If you're just joining us this morning, uh, here for a, a horrific surprise. right out of one of the movies you would see in Hollywood. People walking around with uh, cell phones in tears, uh, holding their heads, looking up at what's left of the World Trade Center, and just shaking their heads in disbelief. Out on the street, everyone knew what just happened. The South Tower was gone. They saw it collapse and ran. Waited. Time slowed down and everything became pitch black. Everybody all right? Yeah, I'm okay. How's the way out of here? And then realize, okay, um, I'm not dead. Oh, yeah, right here. So let's uh, turn on my uh, floodlight on top of my camera. 
All right, come on down this way. Oh. Yeah, let's get out the way we came in. Inside the Trade Center, yeah. all Jules and Chief Pfeiffer knew. Well, yeah, right here. All anyone knew was that something had gone terribly wrong. They asked me, you with the light, to help us out. We gotta get everybody out! Was pointing my light wherever they needed. I remember seeing Chief Pfeiffer. Command post to Tower One. Got to all units. Evacuate the building. Command post to all units. He gave it right away. Very calm. Didn't wait. And it was for him, it was a precaution. It was okay. Something wrong is happening. Let's get everybody out. Where's that flashlight? From the tone of his voice, I knew that it was no normal thing. I knew it was time to leave. I remember saying to the guys, well, it's, uh, we're on our own now. And for the first time, I looked in someone else's eyes and saw fear, Whew. which you don't see with the firemen. We orderly evacuated. Well, it was such a long walk, 21, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13. I was going down the stairs. I can remember a fireman resting on the landing and uh, telling them, you know, we've heard a mayday get out of the building. And, uh, I don't think they, a lot of them, I know for a fact, did not take it serious. Sarge? I was not even consciously filming. I was just had my camera by my side and pointing the light wherever they needed. Sorry. Yeah. Needed my light to, uh, to, to actually help someone, and then I realized it was Father Judge. Hey guys, here we need a hand. We saw him lying at the, the base of the escalator where we were, and I, I removed his white collar and I opened up his shirt. And I remember checking for his pulse and realizing at that time uh, um, he was gone. All right, we got four guys. Yeah, got Top of the escalator. Top of the escalator. Top of the escalator. After that, we had to figure out how to get out of where we were. If you go out this way, uh, right where we are now, people are still jumping, debris still falling, and it's too dangerous. You cannot go out this way. In World Trade Center, we took uh, a hit on that last explosion. Which way? Chief Pfeiffer tells the people carrying Father Judge, okay, stay here. Which way? I told him that I'll be back and wait here and I'll see if the bridge is, is still here. Chief Pfeiffer went to check one of the footbridges leading out of the Trade Center. If it was still standing, it'd be their best way out. for the first time if, uh, if Julie is still alive. I never thought about it uh, before. Honey, it's a, it's a terrible, terrible day. I'm sure they're happy. I realized that Jules could be dead at that very moment. And I was feeling so responsible. I was the one who, uh, 
put him in this situation. I had to find you. Gideon hitched a ride with three off-duty firemen, determined to get to the trade center the only way they could, in a pickup truck. being given, and we start to figure out, OK, it's much be worse than we think, because you cannot have that many maydays and all that dust and that noise. That's when I felt the danger for the first time. It was all around you. I mean, every single cell of your body was telling you, you know, you shouldn't be here. The scenery was radically different. I mean, it was this white powder everywhere. Just a few people here and there. Take yourself his mask. Get masked, we get an extra cylinder, and I want to go in. And this kind of silence. You have ambulances straight down. Thank of you. course, Thank uh, you. there's no word on casualties. You have ambulances straight down. But suffice to say, the uh, loss of life, uh, presumably profound. Ambulance straight down. Down. Of course, at this point, everyone's concern is just getting north, getting away from the World Trade Center, as well as finding out where their families are. The south tower of the World Trade Center just minutes ago collapsed to the ground. Only one tower is standing at this point. I have a direct line of sight to what is left of the World Trade Center. The fire continues to burn. I can see the flames through the thick smoke. By this time, Chief Pfeiffer had found a safe exit and tried to radio the men in the lobby. No answer. So we walked across the bridge back towards the Trade Center. Still trying to call on the radio and not getting through. The guys that we left there, they're not there anymore. They had already gone out another way, carrying the body of Father Michael Judge down the street to St. Peter's Church. They laid his body on the altar. Father Mike's death certificate is number 00001, the first official casualty of the attacks. The chief, his aide, Eddie Fahey, and Jules walked outside, underneath the footbridge they just crossed, and into a scene that none of them could even comprehend. And there's debris everywhere. There's dust covering the entire place. And we look, and the tower's here. So we say, OK. Probably it was something else. The tower is nice. It's standing. The other one, we can't see it, but it's probably just, you know, on the other side. And no one tells us. We have no clue. So we walk north, just trying to figure out what took place here, and then try to gain some control. And then was it just a, a sense that this wasn't a good place to stay? Chief Pfeiffer's priority 
was to set up a new command post and find his men. Right now, they were coming down the stairs. At some point, I started to run. I don't know, even know if I was touching stairs on my way down. When I got about to three or two is when I started to think of my family, you know. So I got to get out of here. When we reached the lobby, I, I joked about it. I said uh, the command post was abandoned. The board was set up and nobody was there. I said, oh, this is not a good sign. <laughs> I knew there was nothing I could really do. I mean, I was not a fireman. I had absolutely no medical expertise at all. Um, I was just a civilian. But as a cameraman, yeah, there was something I could do. And it was to document what was happening. So the cameraman took over and just filmed. Gideon had made his way as close to the tower as he could. Strange enough, the only thing I was that was my preoccupation was to 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 clean my lens. Jules was with Chief Pfeiffer who was plotting his next move. The firefighters from my house had reached the lobby and scattered. You know, kind of walking at this point. We knew we were out of the building, felt we were safe. Unfortunately, there were people jumping out of windows. You could see them hitting the ground or around you, debris hitting the ground. Get yourself a cannon below a chief glory down at staging. Let's move. Come on, officers. Basically, Everybody was standing right in the shadow of Tower One. It was 10.28 in the morning. And this huge roar. And I don't even have time to think at that point. I just, I just run. Then I, I feel someone jumping on top of me, and then the dust. I was going to die. We need help! And the only thing I could think about was truth. And I remember telling myself that if I would survive that, I would, uh, I would be a, a better brother. Let's go before the car blew up! And it's dead silence. It's nothing. No radio calls, no, no sound, nothing. <laughs> and I feel the person who was on top of me get up. And I recognize it's Chief Pfeiffer's voice. And I just realized it's just, you know, it jumped on top of me to protect me from all this. Chief Pfeiffer said, okay, let's go now. And we get up, 
the dust starts to clear because the wind was blowing in the opposite direction. After that, it was just trying to literally walk around the block and, and regroup and walk back to the scene and, and see what we could do. Some water, something to drink. Open your mouth, open your mouth, because I need the water too. I had been in this street three times in the last hour. The first time it was full of people. The second time, everybody was running away from it. The third time, getting out of the last collapse, there was just nobody. And everything was white. Everything was covered by the dust. Holy shit. It was the most surreal scene I have ever seen. Uh, I cannot describe what took place. It is uh, a scene just not to be believed. The smoke's still billowing. What we do have uh, is a lockdown. You can't get in, you can't get out, you can't go up, you can't go down. I see that I'm still in the middle of the street, uh, and I see there is a little deli. It seems to be open in the corner. Yeah, we're getting out too now. Oh, okay. A lot of people injured. <laughs> Firefighters, bloody nose, things like that. <laughs> and then it hits me. But now, where is my brother? I start realizing that I've probably lost my brother. So I try to go back to the World Trade Center. I need to go find my brother. Where are the guys? I have no idea. Where's Mr. Chick from? And I'm in the middle of the street walking, and a cop approached me and says, you know, who are you with? Who's the chief of uh, Battalion 1? Oh, your Battalion 1? Yeah. You got an ID? Yeah, I my letter of, uh, oh, from take, the commissioner. Uh, take your letter that. and your camera you and get out of here. You. All right? Go. So I go back up, walk north, not really knowing where I'm going. Police department? No, I'm making a documentary on, on the fire department. Come on, this ain't fucking Disneyland. Let's go. And after a while, I said, you know, there's nothing I can do here. I need to, I need to go back to the firehouse. Maybe they'll have some news, and maybe, maybe he's already back there. But at that point, I just, I think he's dead. And it becomes, it becomes too overwhelming. IVD'ers, de officier van justitie, de douane, treinconducteurs, leraren, wijkagenten, wetenschappers. De marechaussee, meer dan 200.000 professionals. Survivor. Little to little, the guys started to come back, one by one. 
can't explain why I'm here and there's so many dead. Very emotional. A lot of guys are crying. So many thoughts and emotions and... We lost, we, uh, the way we left out, we were in one. Two fell first, and then they told us to get out. Two fell first? Two fell first. Yeah, two I can't figure this out. First. One didn't fall first. That's why they were getting us out. We got to call our loved ones, tell them we were okay. It was fucking sick. Well, we just got out. We just got out. I got up two blocks, and I'm like, I'm still not far enough. I got to this thing. Like that. So, you know, you just needed to be with... With the guys, you know. I couldn't get back in. They put me up. I was never so glad to see firemen in my life. It was a, it was a, it was a great thing to, to know that, uh, that uh, people were surviving this. I thought you guys were dead. Not the only one. I thought I was dead. That was the scariest thing when I came out. It's like, oh my God, am I glad to see you? We were, uh, we were the lucky ones. I don't think it's luck. I mean, it's a miracle that we're here. Miracle isn't a word you hear much from firefighters, especially not on that day. But what else could you call it? One guy after another was making it back safe. I'm down here looking. I got. I, I can't believe we all made it out. How did we make it out of that building? 30 seconds. Another two flights higher. Again, the cameraman would just film them coming back and asking them if they had seen Jules. And nobody could answer this question. It was extremely uh, frustrating and annoying. One guy from the firehouse came to me and I asked him, you know, have, have you seen Jules? I mean, do you know where he is? And he looked at me and he said, yes, he's behind you. And I turned over and Jules was there in the firehouse. I didn't even see him coming in. It was like meeting for the first time. Huh? I asked Jules if he's all right. He tells me yes tells me that he was all that time in the lobby. I tell him, I know now what it's like to think you're going to die. And then, and then I tell him, I got the first plane, and I filmed, and do you have enough tape? <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, good to see you. All right, you OK? Yeah. Yeah, close? Under. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Good. All right. All right. And it definitely was a miracle, you know. Oh, fuck, man. Don't worry about it. You don't know what happened to you guys. Oh God. You're everybody's all right. Everybody's accounted for. Right here. Everybody? Right here. Everybody's accounted for. Everybody come back one by one to the firehouse, except one. Did you see Tony over there, Ben Tony. Yeah, that's what I heard. He we were all accounted for, except for Tony. Everybody was wondering about Tony. There is not anything recognizable of what were the two trade towers, nothing standing out from those clouds of dust at this time. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
No, oh, that day. That day changed everything. I think I got fibers in there. You got fibers in there. When I came back that day to the firehouse, one firefighter came to me and he said, you know, yesterday you had one brother. Today you have 50. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to even describe the emotions in the firehouse that day. And it was just like, you heard the ground rumble, and it was just fucking debris was just chasing you. We were running, hauling ass. On one hand, you're celebrating. Very frightful day, man. Very happy to be here. Somehow the guys from our house, they got out. We lost so much that in that two-hour period. Are you doing all right? And we felt like we got the hell kicked out of us. Shot, I don't know what to do, man. Go back down there or what? Fucking yeah. shot. Yeah. At the same time, we knew hundreds of firefighters thousands of people had to have died in those towers. <laughs> and every hour that passed, we were more certain Tony Benetados was one of them. Hey, guys, uh, Deputy Chief Hill called. First Division, he doesn't want anybody else down here right now. Everybody was wondering about Tony. James just put his gear and went by himself to look for Tony. I'd come in from home, and yeah, we were ordered to stay at the firehouse. But the truth is, the guys had to go back. Had to start digging for survivors. That yeah, fucking mentality, get in there, get in there, get in there, get the people out. It's bred in you, it's programmed into you. I had to go back. And find the kid. I got down there just as Seven World Trade finally collapsed. Hey, Rick, been going live with you the whole no sign of Tony anywhere. It had to be almost six o'clock, nine hours after everything started, hey, that Tony just walked in. I walked in like a daze. And they were all like, hey, it's Benetados, you're all right. What's wrong with your hand, anything? No. No? Yeah, you all right? Yeah. Just chill out. How are you doing? You okay? Yeah, I'm all right. Oh. What happened on your end? Uh, I was in the building. Were you? Yeah. Is everyone from the house? Everybody. Everyone? Everybody's got it for. I just asked, did everyone get back? And they were like, yeah. <laughs> that felt pretty good. You motherfuckers, man. I was so sure you dudes were dead. I'm fucking digging through shit. And you fuckers are chilling here eating oranges. And I'm roaming around looking for you. The last one that went out there came back. And we were all OK. I left here uh, right after the first collapse. Turns out. Tony had been with Larry Burns the whole time, the proby and the retired chief. They were right there when Tower One came down. I checked all the rigs. There were rigs crushed, paramedic trucks covered with rubble, flipped, fires burning everywhere, huge fires. That whole day, I just searched through rubble lifting things up, checking underneath. It was hard for him. It was very hard for him. He's only been a firefighter for, you know, a couple of months. But he proved himself that day to all the guys, you know. There was 
so much that we didn't know about that first day. Who had attacked us, how, why. All we knew is that nothing would ever be the same. And then, of course, the, the images of the replay that never stops of the planes hitting, the towers coming down. And it was like, OK, enough TV. Thankfully, the, uh, the power went out about that time, so it was, it was a relief. This is generator maybe in the uh, courtyard. And uh, then we'll hook the lights into it. I got two more sets of lights coming. The entire downtown Manhattan lose power. It was really this feeling that we're going to be there for a long time. Just a short while ago, Mayor Giuliani held a news conference saying it's important not to lash out in anger because of the attacks on the World Trade Center. Most of us stayed at the firehouse that night, trying to take it all in. The roof of the Marriott, we were on the roof of the Marriott. There was parts all over the fucking place, legs, feet. It was nasty. You all right, brother? Yeah, I'm all right. One of the things that sticks with me more than everything I saw is I sat down to sit next to Ted. He looked real bad. I said, Tony, man, it, it, was, it was raining bodies. And just the way he said it, man, it just... The man had been through hell. Good evening. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. It's a very depressed, dismal, miserable mood. Hundreds of firemen, thousands of civilians are gone. As much as quickly as you blow out a match, I go flip a switch, I go. That's it. Spillings came down. Go. You see them? It's hard to believe they're not there. They're not there. This was my first reaction. They're gone. There is no more World Trade Center. No. It did happen, right? It's not something that I'm going to close my eyes and, and open them again, and, and I'm going to see the tower, right? It's not there. You know, and, and the only thing you have, really, and, you know, and the only thing that really kept it all together was us as a group, as a body, as a firehouse. Around midnight, we sent Tony up to lower the flag to half-mast again. There's going to be a lot of pain to deal with in the future. I have a pretty good friend. Well, it was in my uh, academy class in my squad. It was among the missing. A lot of guys, we all lost friends and family. I don't want to ever have to put that thing in half mast again for the rest of my career. That's it. Until the recall ends, it's 24 on, 24 off, 24 on, 24 off. We got word that we'd start digging in the morning. Some of the guys with wives and kids went home just for a few hours. They knew it might be days before they'd see their families again. We're all alive. That's, that's more than, than we could have possibly hoped for. So our job now is to go and do whatever needs to be done and do it as much and as hard as we can for as long as they'll let us. 
Some of the guys took a city bus down to what the media was already calling Ground Zero. Hey, guys, got extra uh, surgical gloves. You guys didn't put them in your pockets. Some firemen called it the pile. For us, it was still the Trade Center, even if it was gone. Hey, guys, if you hear three horns, that means something might be coming down. So keep your eyes open when you're walking around down there. Digging fast, passing those buckets quick. Digging frantically. Bucket! Bucket! Hey, watch your back, guys. We'd be digging, and, and all of a sudden, everybody would say, quiet. The whole place would get quiet and people would look. Slowly, they would go back to work and, and start again. And that was, that's how things went down there. I remember the first time I went there, it was like, you know, gateway to hell. Technically, Jules and Gideon shouldn't have been anywhere near that site. It was dangerous enough for us firefighters. Every step you took, you could fall 30, 40 feet into a void. Jules and Gideon said they had to be there, but not to film. We would only take the camera and film for a few minutes. In fact, we forced ourselves to take the camera down because we just wanted to go there and, and help. We'd clear what we could by hand. And the iron workers would come in, cut the steel beams, and lift them out. Then we'd just start digging again. You have two 110-story office buildings. You don't find a desk. You don't find a chair. You don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found 
was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. The building collapsed to dust. How are we supposed to find anybody in this that there's nothing left of the building? Bucket! You find a little spot, and you just keep going and digging and digging and trying to find something. And you find a foot, and then they say the building's gonna collapse, and you run away. Go, go, go! And then we would go back and mostly just dug. We found we found a body. It was a girl. She was dead. She was she was definitely dead. All her clothes had been burned off her. She looked to be pregnant. Some people thought maybe she was just bloated, but I don't think so. She was she was encased in rubble. And we had her about halfway uncovered. We had getting the body bag ready, and then they told us to run. And we ran. I never got to see if they got her out. But would have felt good getting, saying, all right, at least I got one person out. One family will be able to have a decent funeral. Our first shift was 24 hours. And in all that time, there was one person pulled out alive. One. It was beyond discouraging. It was even hard to understand. Listen, we try to keep hope. And we look everywhere. We even crawl down into the stores and the subway tunnels underneath the site. But as days turned into weeks, you began to accept. There just wasn't anybody to find. But we never stopped looking. Hey, Chief. Yes, sir. We got another body over here. Firemen deal with ugly things every day. It's part of the job. But this was worse. You got that body back. Day after day, it pushed guys to their limit, maybe past it. A lot of guys don't know if they're going to do the job anymore. I know it's either this or the Army now. And I like saving lives. I don't like taking them. But after what I saw, if, they, if my country decides to send me to go kill, I'll do it now. Every night around dinner time, the fire department would put out a list of firefighters confirmed dead. And every night, that list got longer. It is with regret that the department announces the death of the following members. Battalion Chief John P. Williamson. Firefighter William Henry. Firefighter Eric T. Allen. Firefighter Manuel Mojica. 
Firefighter Thomas P. Hannafin. Firefighter John A. Ventura. Firefighter John We've lost so many people that everybody has lost dear friends, and not just one or two, but, but dozens. Most days, there was a memorial service for some guy you knew. Some days, two or three. Some days, four. One of those services was for Kevin Pfeiffer, the chief's brother. He was last seen in the stairs of Tower One, directing guys to the fastest way out of the building. I, I would say that Chief Pfeiffer's brother saved my life. Saved a lot of lives. And I remember uh, walking down West Street and just remembering saying, uh, you know, how much my brother and I used to love being downtown and, uh, and doing this job. And, um, and, um, and how now I didn't love it anymore. A few weeks passed, and we got new rigs. Well, used rigs, to replace engine seven and ladder one. They're still buried in there somewhere, under the pile. Eventually, we started going on runs again. Feels good, though. Playing pranks again and trying our best to love the job again. But things will never be the way they were. Every now and then still wonder, is it, is it really true, you know? I know it happened, but I don't know. How, how, how do you deal with something like this? It's the 11th every day for me when I wake up. So did you want the new tape? As for Jules and Gideon, it's strange how things work out. In the beginning, they came to me and they said, let's make a documentary about a boy becoming a man during his nine-month probationary period. Turns out Tony became a man in about nine hours, trying to help out on 9-11. You know how you can tell that? He's not bragging about it. They said to Phil, we were the only ones on the ticket, but they said to Phil 1075. Do I feel like it's given me more of a sense of self-worth? Yes. Has it made me a man? No. What's a man? You know, I'll still watch cartoons and do my stupid things. I'm just a person who tries to do good, just like every other person in the fire department. For the fire department, now it's about rebuilding, somehow. At our firehouse, we've already got new probies to break in. You get one chance to make a first impression. Two guys fresh out of the academy. It's strange to think they'll never know what it was like to be a New York City fireman before September 11th. And they'll never really understand what we lost that day. All we can do is tell them the stories and show them the tape.
In the end, it's hard to weigh what happened on September 11th. You can measure some things, the height of a building, the size of its floors, the number of people who work there. Bricks and steel are one thing, but human lives, you can't calculate that. Nearly 3,000 people died here on 9-11. Nearly 200 more at the Pentagon. Still more in the plane that crashed that day in Pennsylvania. You can add it up, but numbers don't do justice to what was really lost. There are many people still working here at Ground Zero. It's now hallowed ground. So every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the work goes on in the hope that it'll give the families of those who were lost some peace. One of the disappointing things that I heard from like other firefighters after 9-11 is they kept asking us, you know, why did you guys all survive? You know, I thought that was a very unfair question. How could you ask me why I survived? I don't know why I survived. If I sneeze, I'll sneeze up black. I think about it every day, every day. When my head hits the pillow at night, it's 9-11. I see a beautiful blue sky, it's 9-11. I see a low-flying plane, it's 9-11. I think about that day just about every day. I do think about it often, of course. I think about the people. By day's end, the New York City Fire Department had lost 343 firefighters. I think the toughest thing that was to see these guys was that list that was circulating every day, the new list of the guys they had found, and they don't want to touch it because they know that if they go through it, two, three, four, ten more of their friends will be listed there. And that was the hardest for me to see is, you know, them going through that list. It is with regret that the department announces the deaths of the following members. The guys from 7 and 1, I am linked to in a very strong way. And no matter what happens, in our lives or in our careers, we will always be bonded through the Trade Center. As time passed, life at the firehouse went back to normal. You see that? Watch. Yeah, still cooking, still you know playing basketball, softball. 
Dinner dances, picnics, still doing stuff together with the families. But in reality, everything had changed. After 9-11, no call would ever be routine. Everything that sounds odd, like smoking in the subway, some multiple people injured, you start thinking everything is terrorism. So you, you approach it different. And something else that changed. All the new faces around the kitchen table. Uh, since 9-11, we've had almost a 50% turnover. I give the new guys more credit because they, they took the test and took the job after 9-11. They knew what happened 9-11. They know what can happen again. And they still took the job. Don't tell me you need a helmet if you don't need a helmet. Because there's companies that have nothing. Captain Dennis Tardio, revered by his men for his leadership on 9-11 would retire just six months later. He was a sweet man. I remember him giving us a speech, a little bit of a pep talk after the Trade Center. And the man looked like he was going to cry. I've said it before. I'll say it again. I'll say it forever. I'm proud and honored to be a member of this house. I thank each and every one of you how we're here. Only God knows, but again, guys, thank you so much. I really, you have no idea. The last fire that I fought, people are outside and they're saying, everybody's out, everybody's out. And I find myself inside the room on fire, searching. Everybody's out, why am I in here? There's no, you know, I felt I'm taking an unnecessary risk right now. And uh, if I jeopardize my own life, that's one thing. But if I'm, if I'm taking risks and I'm subjecting the other firefighters to those unnecessary risks, I'm not doing my job. And I think it was at that moment I realized that it's time to, uh, it's time to retire. I uh, basically needed to be away from the job. And Tony, the former probie of Ladder One would also find his life going in a different direction after 9-11, rising to the new challenges of the FDNY. I figured if another incident happened, I wanted to make sure that I was there and then I would be able to do something. A couple months after the Trade Center, I made my way over to Hazmat One. Hazmat One is the fire department's and then only real response for nuclear, biological, chemical, and industrial hazmat incidents. They prepare us for any type of terrorist incident that you could possibly come across. Tony's doing very well. I met him a couple days after the uh, after 9-11. He says, you know, Chief, I would like to go to hazmat and become a hazmatician. I says, Tony, you got to become a fireman first. After you become a fireman, we'll put you any way you want. So he did his time. He's now one of the best hazmat folks we have out there. Chief Pfeiffer, promoted twice since 9-11, now heads up the FDNY's counterterrorism and emergency preparedness unit. Uh, I've looked and examined the, the whole response to the Trade Center. I wish we would have seen well, we heard what everyone saw on TV. We didn't get any messages that the uh, top 15 floors were glowing red or that the building looks like it was going to collapse. So what I do now is to make sure that we receive information, that there is a unified command, that, that information is readily exchanged for all first responders and to better coordinate a rescue effort. All bridges south of 130 Street are not to be used by anyone. I guess people would think after five years, well, that's behind us all. It's not. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. One, it creates a sense of urgency to, to change, to, for the department to change. What normally would have taken decades to accomplish, we were able to accomplish in less than five years. It also keeps the memories of the people we love alive. Um, when you do feel some pain, that means they're still there with you, at least in your heart. 
I can see that what he's doing is doing it for his brother. That, you know, his life has taken a, a higher purpose. There is a sadness that I can always feel is, you know, buried below the surface. Thomas Joseph Schubert. My mother and my hero, Stephanie Marie McKenna. I love you. And my father, William Ralph Robb. I love you, Daddy. Firefighter Lieutenant Joseph Gerard Levy. We miss you and love you. And our beloved son, firefighter Christopher A. Santora, Engine 54. We love you, Christopher. We miss you, Christopher. I was in the building on the 35th floor, and I'm looking out the window. It was dust everywhere. I seen about two ambulances that was turned over. I seen numerous cars turned over. It looked like a war zone out there. I saw a lot of people jump, and I, I feel so terribly bad for them because of where they had to be, it was better for them to jump than to stay where they were. I remember we went out and the chief was holding up, was holding up something. It was gray, everything was gray and stringy and it looked like shag carpeting. And it was like flesh, just a chunk that had been torn off someone. So put it in a little bag and seal it. And mark it and take it to the morgue. And it just became so desensitized to the death. During the rescue and recovery, recovery operations, there was a chaplain from the Oklahoma City Fire Department down there. And I was talking with him, and he was telling me all the problems that the firefighters there were experiencing. Alcoholism, divorce, depression, all the maladies. And I thought, and I said, well, and you didn't lose any firefighters. And he goes, right. They lost 168 civilians. And I said, my God, what are we in for? The fire department knew their men would need help, so they reached out for their own, to men like Joe Hines, a psychologist and former fireman who had lost his eyesight in an accident. How are you doing, guys? the counseling unit. How are you? The most difficult problem for me as a psychologist to deal with is the one of denial, that I'm OK. You know, I'm a tough guy. I'm a fireman. I'm a New York City fireman. Okay? I take care of myself. I don't want to talk about myself because uh, the people that died that day can't. They can't talk. I wish I could speak for them, but I don't know what to say. They don't want to go to counseling for two reasons. One, they don't think they need it, and sometimes I know they need it. On the other side of the coin, of course, they don't want to be going to counseling because their fellow firefighters may not think that strongly of them. You working? All right? All right, I'm heading down. After a few weeks, I would just start getting irritable, yelling at the guys for, for things that they didn't deserve to be yelled at. And they helped me out by understanding. And, but I was smart enough to realize that you know, this is it. I think I ought to back off and, and seek counseling here. Here they are, the first one to go in. Probably among the last one, in fact, suddenly among the last one to leave, running. And no one died. When so many of their friends, firefighters, all around the city, 
are not here anymore. The guilt that it had created is tremendous. One of the disappointing things that I heard from like other firefighters after 9-11 is they kept asking us, you know, why did you guys all survive? You know, I thought that was a very unfair question. How could you ask me why I survived? I don't know why I survived or why everybody from Ladder 1 survived. It was because of our timing when we got there, because we were carrying people down, that we didn't get as high up. But when I came out of the building, I guarantee you, if I ran west or south, I would have died. But I didn't. I chose north. Why I chose north? It was only for one simple reason. It's because people were jumping out of that building, and they were landing all over my rig, and there was a north walkway, and all I was trying to do was get underneath that north walkway. Immediately after the collapse out on West Street, hoping to recover some of the firefighters and the victims that might be alive, so many men were coming in, firefighters, both active and retired, coming in and asking me, have you seen my father? Have you seen my son? Have you seen my brother? And unfortunately, all too often, I knew what the answer was. Um, they were most likely dead. You know, I, I was wondering where my brother was. I couldn't contact him on the radio. And I just remember walking around, looking at the different firefighters and, and wondering where um, my brother's company, Engine 33, was. The fire department had a, uh, a unique group of, of other brothers, uh, biological brothers, that uh, um, um, were killed that day. So for, for a number of months, we met as a group of brothers of, of brothers, uh, and, uh, and, and that, was, that was a good thing for me. And it's, it's not even in the words that we said to each other. It was really just knowing that someone else is going through the, the, same, the same type of problems, the, the same type of loss. It was that um, special closeness um, that, and, and that, um, that knowing that someone understands um, was probably most therapeutic. Five years later, at the World Trade Center, there is still no building to replace it, no memorial to remember those who died there, just a lot of politics and an empty hole in the ground. Five years later, we still don't have a memorial. Five years later, at that holy ground, there's still a hole in the ground. The fire department built their own memorial to honor those who never came home on September 11th. There is a permanent place for them just in the shadow of Ground Zero. A bronze wall with the names of all 343 firefighters who died that day. With this memorial, we will ensure that their memory is kept alive. They will be known as Firefighter Michael Boyle, Firefighter John Vigiano, Lieutenant Kevin Dowdell, Captain Patrick Brown, Chief Peter Gancy. They deserve that recognition, and we made sure that they got it. We have a beautiful mural there at 10 and 10, which was our ground zero. So we fulfilled our promise. You guys are coming down with cancer, and you know, are you going to be 344, 345, 346? That day, the, the dust was so thick that you couldn't see the hand in front of your face, that you barely could breathe. So I wonder what's the store for me and what's in store for the other firefighters. From the start, rescue workers at Ground Zero were assured by authorities that the air was safe. But despite what authorities said, it appeared to be different. Almost immediately after that, I started having severe chest pains. I would say it's definitely related to that. 
I'm afraid of what's going to happen to me. I know I still have the cough. I have the cough from 9-11. Um, I'm starting to develop wheezing from 9-11. I was down there from 9-11-01 all the way to July. I've heard a lot of things what happened to other guys, you know, getting asthma and all of that. I know, I know our, our folders are stamped WTC. I have a, a chronic bronchitis. Um, I had a persistent cough. If I sneeze, I'll sneeze up black. There's something out there cooking in all of us. And I fear for what 10 years are going to bring us. And then it happened. Sooner than many had thought. Jimmy worked close to 500 hours at the World Trade Center. Only to be protected by a paper mask. Within weeks, he developed a cough that would later be called the World Trade Center cough. We watched him progressively get worse until he died at home. The medical examiner reported that James died a severe lung condition, which was black lung, making him the first police officer whose death was diagnosed to the direct result of World Trade Center. Will it get me someday? I fear it. I hear stories. The Trade Center changed me. I'm, I know it did. But so does everything. I don't think it's the severity of an event that changes who you are. I think it's how you interpret it. When I was 13, I had a sister who took her own life through fire. And I witnessed everything. And those images plagued me for quite a while afterwards. When the Trade Center happened, I was not going to wallow in sorrow or think about the losses that had happened in my life, because what point is there in that? I focused on the positive things. These days, Lieutenant Bill Walsh finds peace, spending time with his granddaughter, Junebug. Being four years old when this 9-11 incident happened, was, uh, she, was, uh, she was my therapy. She was a, a, a person that I could go to and play simple games. Uh, I could help her with her schoolwork, and I could just remove myself from the average stress that occurs after a traumatic event like 9-11. John O'Neill retired a year after 9-11 and moved to an island down south. Coming into New York on the plane the other day, not seeing the towers, that was the first time I've flown since uh, before 9-11. And not seeing the towers there left me with kind of an empty feeling. The birth of my son pretty much got me through it all. I, I was very big. My first son. So now to have a little me running around, somebody that I can pass the torch to somewhere down the line. So that, that was pretty important. After five years, I, I don't feel it, it gets easier. At least not for me. I don't know how everybody else feels. But for me, it, it's just a uh, day by day. One day at a time. I believe in living from day to day. Look at the big picture and deal with the problems as they come on a daily basis. Uh, I bought a new house out on Long Island. We moved. Moved in a, into a town where five of my children live. So I'm surrounded by my children and grandchildren. And I'm very happy at that. Two fish. As for Jules, Gideon, and myself, life moved on. We went back to making documentaries. And when Jules got married, well, there was only one place for this to happen. I got married in the firehouse. That was, that was significant and it was beautiful because, you know, that, that firehouse, that for so long after that event was 
had become a symbol of sorrow and death and destruction. Suddenly one day it was turned into the celebration of love. They were just white everywhere, and flowers and, and laughter. And that was very special. And for the men of Engine 7 and Ladder 1, they will always remember the day that changed their lives forever. I would like people to remember that day just knowing that there was a lot of heroes that day, not even just the FDNY. I'm not talking about the FDNY. I'm talking about people in general, civilians in general. The legacy of the Trade Center should be life and humanity. It was a terrible day, certainly, for the city, for the nation, for the world, particularly for the fire department. Um, uh, but I was never more proud to be a firefighter than on 9-11. 9-11, to me, I, I will always remember as a proud day, proud day for Engine 7 and, and its members, uh, for the entire FDMY. It was, it, 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 it was, uh, our saddest, but our finest moment. It was a day where um, ordinary firefighters and rescuers um, during a, a very extraordinary time worked very hard and under most difficult circumstances to help their fellow human beings. There's nothing more impressive than, than actually witnessing that happen. Nieuw bij SBSS. Uniek op de Nederlandse televisie. Medisch Centrum. Ervaar de dagelijkse realiteit van het personeel van het Erasmus MC in Rotterdam. Vanaf maandag 11 september. Iedere werkdag om vijf voor half zeven bij SBSS. Medisch Centrum.